Welcome back from lunch. Uh, we have the pleasure of being the post-lunch uh, entertainment gig. Um, so yesterday in my remarks, I said that the domestic and international were uh, increasingly blurred. And some of the other panels have also added to uh, this blurring by talking about crime or natural disasters or uh, cultural affinities or divides that really ignore national boundaries. So even though the domestic and international are kind of intertwined in a growing manner, uh, I'd like for us, for this panel, to consider mostly activities abroad, things that we are doing uh, overseas. Um, in putting this agenda together, uh, we couldn't cover every aspect of the questions that are relevant to the kind of broad topic. And one of the glaring omissions, uh, not because of oversight, but because of constraints of time and space, is a comparative panel. So it's a panel that would look at what we can or cannot learn from the experience of other states facing uh, similar or maybe not so similar challenges. But there is a way in which such comparisons uh, lend themselves to the present discussion. And perhaps one obvious such uh, comparison is the transatlantic divide over the use of force, over the uh, norms and uh, kind of general acceptance or aversion to the use of force. As Robert Kagan points out, Europeans generally have an aversion to the use of force, use of military force for them. Sticks and carrots are things you borrow from the world of commerce, from trade, from immigration. Uh, but by and large, uh, the term war is very uh, agonizing. Um, and for Americans, this European view is kind of moral hypocrisy that enjoys the umbrella that the United States offers militarily to anything that's a European interest. So uh, with that in mind, sort of focusing on these questions, I want to offer kind of several questions to, uh, for the panelists, which they are free to either address or ignore altogether. Uh, so really generally just the utility of the use of force or utility of military force um, when we talk about promoting democracy or doing reconstruction or just addressing the conditions that allow uh, rogue elements to flourish or operate against American interests from overseas. So what, are the, what is the utility of force? What are the costs of engaging in these activities? And we talk about costs, uh, and I you know, we, we didn't really talk, we mentioned it briefly yesterday, but the real cost, so cost in the most uh, immediate sense of dollars, uh, and I, I think a couple of us observed yesterday that if we had were spending an iota what we spend on actual security on cancer research or education or things like that, the world uh, could have been a better place. Um, is there a trade-off between the amount of force we use abroad and how much coercion we can do or we should do domestically? So are we, is there an incentive to do more outside of the borders so that we can better protect civil liberties or be less coercive domestically? And if so, is this a, 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 a fair or legitimate trade-off? Uh, Maybe, John, you would like to address sort of the CIA military trade-offs and who is in the business of protecting power. And this is really about the changing nature of war. Uh, so if in old wars it was easy to find the enemy, it was harder to disable him. Uh, today we're sort of in the opposite stance. It's hard to find the enemy. It's fairly easy to uh, neutralize it. Um, so in that sense, is there uh, kind of changes in the interplay between uh, CIA and military organizations that uh, operate uh, outside the territory of the United States? Uh, the implications of international cooperation, John Brennan mentioned this yesterday in his remarks. Uh, we rely on other countries for intelligence. We rely on other countries for frustrating uh, terrorist threats, that means that if we want them in a coalition with us, we need to be attuned to uh, their concerns and their values and their view of how the world operates and how it should operate. Uh, so to quote Antonia Chase, uh, we've created a coalition of the willing alongside a coalition of the pissed. Um, how much do we need to take that into account when we devise an international strategy? Um, 
And finally, in, in that vein, sort of the broad norms that govern the use of force. So we heard yesterday, again, this doctrine of the unable and unwilling. Uh, that's not a doctrine that is widely shared by the rest of the world. Uh, should we care that it's not shared by the rest of the world? Is there something unique that comes with being the world's police officer, the, the, the country that will take the lead, whether it's on rescue operations in Haiti or the military operation in Libya, that puts you also in a unique position to shape norms. Uh, and in doing that, whether you also, I mean, you also have to consider how the shaping of norms is going to be used or abused uh, by others in the theater. Uh, so with that, we have a wonderful group of people to address these questions, and we'll begin by with uh, Ken Anderson. Thank you. Now, I'm actually going to fall in the category of ignoring almost everything that Gabby has raised as questions. I'm actually going to be much more focused um, in terms of topic than this uh, in one way, but also um, broader in framing the question of use of force in a different way. So let me start with kind of point zero. Point zero for me is that the scariest graphic that I have seen in quite a long time is one that uh, Julian Koo reproduced at Opanio Uris um, a few days ago that shows China's self-defined claims in the South China Sea and the line that defines what they regard as sovereign waters for China. Um, as far as I can tell, the line skirts within two feet of the Philippines uh, and several other countries. And my point is that we are focused on looking forward in the standpoint of non-state actors, um, use of force and many other things in relation to terrorism threats and other things. But we do need to keep at the back of our minds that conventional war is not something that has disappeared from the field of history and certainly not from Asia or from the Pacific. And so whatever we say on a going forward basis, which is entirely my focus here, we do have to bear in mind that security issues of a state-to-state -state nature, if anything, are rising in importance in Asia rather than diminishing. Now let me shift to non-state actors. And here's what I think that we've learned. Um, in the two-sentence version from the last 10 years, strategically. One is that we're going to have to address non-state actor threats and um, with the use of force in at least some circumstances and different kinds of uses of force. And we've also concluded that at least in some circumstances we have to be able to go after the non-state actor by bringing down the regime that harbors them. And that is what we pursued in Afghanistan because we uh, understood that the non-state actor was not just hanging out there taking safe haven in a tiny corner hidden somewhere, but was actually quite deeply intertwined with the regime there such as it was. And then we learned a second thing, which is that regime, regime change um, is the best use of large-scale conventional war. But in order to engage in regime change, there has to be a regime to engage in change. And if you were dealing with where much of the non-state actor threat lies at this point, one's talking about ungoverned uh, or weakly governed spaces, and regime change doesn't make a lot of sense there because there isn't any regime to really go after in any sense. And what happens at that point strategically is that one's conventional war turns into counterinsurgency where one is now no longer dealing with a regime as a state that has to be attacked, but one isn't dealing with insurgency. And insurgency is hard and messy and gets one involved in state building and nation building questions and ground and territory. And I think I would say without wanting anybody to come back to me and tell me that I turned out to be wrong 10 years from now, I don't think we're very interested in doing a lot more of that for the next while. Uh, and for that reason, what we are left with in terms of addressing state actor threats in the narrow category of how we will use force. Let me be really clear, I'm excluding everything else. We've been talking about lots of other important factors and other ways of approaching this and all the rest of it. I'm solely focused on the use of force slice of that. Uh, we are, roughly speaking, what we've described as counterterrorism. And counterterrorism for us has been 
um, a more successful strategy than probably we thought it would be 10 years ago um, on its own, largely through two things. One is the development of technology that has enabled more focused targeting, um, but more focused targeting through technology that allows us to hop over territory, that allows us to not have to fight our way through on the ground in a counterinsurgency war in order to finally confront the safe haven. And that technology that we think of roughly as our drone strike capability um, is enormously important, but let me add one other piece to that. We tend to imagine drones as being these kind of um, roving global birds of prey that float across the horizon and occasionally strike like Ronin warriors. Um, and what we don't think about in relation to that is that we, th we, we have this vision because they can be piloted from Nevada and operate in Afghanistan and hence it gives this kind of global aspect to it. But the reality is that they're much more like a aircraft flying off of an aircraft carrier. They're tethered to a local base. They've got to have infrastructure, physical infrastructure to land, take off, refuel, repair, um, and all that requires people. It requires all of that infrastructure. And even more important, our success with drones in Afghanistan and Pakistan has been almost entirely due in the last couple of years to the payoff of efforts to develop deep, dense, complicated networks of intelligence on the ground that serve as this kind of fat middle for this very thin tail of the final kinetic application of force through the drone. And our success is almost entirely a function at the end of the day on the combination of technology, but a vast amount of intelligence that integrates signals intelligence plus human intelligence on the ground, none of which comes cheap or easy. And the comparison to Libya is quite instructive. Our allies correctly sought drones as quickly as possible, first for surveillance, and then said, you know, it doesn't really work just to surveil, can you start hitting targets? And they've been much better than what they were able to do with manned aircraft, but they were not, uh, they are not as effective because they don't have this massive sort of intelligence on the ground. Now let me switch to the ethics of this. If you just accept that by assumption that that's the sort of future we're looking at in counterterrorism uses of force, what that invites over the longer term is more smaller, more targeted, more narrowly intensive, but less large scale uses of force. And that sounds an awful lot like what we colloquially, although not in its legal sense, would call covert operations. Um, the term is not really very good because it overlaps with very specific legal meanings in US law. Uh, that don't really quite correspond to this. So I've taken infelicitously to calling it intelligence-driven uses of force that I believe will actually define our counterterrorism use of force efforts going forward. And it's not necessarily drones. It may well be human teams. Um, but it will be targeted killing as much as we can make it targeted on the basis of technology and ways of gathering intelligence about the targets. The ethical issues that are raised by that and the legal issues that are raised by that is I think this, and now let me say something that will sound peculiar and has nothing to do with Charlie Savage's description of the debate between Johnson and Co. that has been in the news for the last couple of days. This is a kind of higher altitude. So let me speak in praise of Harold Co., um, which for those of you who know my general views, this is somewhat surprising. But <laughs> let me state what I believe is Harold Coe's legacy uh, at state, at least in this narrow area, which is that Dean Coe's has essentially put on the table that the category exists and it's going to be used and that it's not just under domestic law, but the United States does not regard it as unlawful under international law, and we just don't talk about it, right? That it recognizes the nature of these kinds of operations for the United States, which is that many, I'm sure not all, but many have moved into a category from being genuinely covert to being merely deniable. 
And we've got a problem here because deniability raises questions about legitimacy, the standards that are being used that we could sort of sweep under the rug at a point of which they really weren't actually known. And so our problem is going to be that we have a group of deniable operations that increasingly dominate our response. They are publicly known to exist, and the answer is exactly what John Brennan said when faced with your question last night. So are you telling us that we have this program? Well, neither confirm nor deny. Hmm. Um, that's not going to be good enough as a basis for saying that we do not have standards for engaging in this. And the signal contribution that Harold Coe, I believe, has made to this debate has been to, on the one hand, acknowledge them and defend their legitimacy in both domestic and international law, but at the same time to wind up saying that their conduct now has to acknowledge that it has standards for how it's done. And so in his ASIL speech where he said there is, you know, even if it's not armed conflict, even if this is just uses of force which are outside of armed conflict and in a purely self-defense paradigm because we're not at war with these people, they're tiny, this does not rise to the level of uh, armed conflict with a non-state actor. There still have to be customary standards for the use of force and those are going to be necessity, distinction, and proportionality. So what I want to suggest is that going forward what's going to be most important from an ethical and legal standpoint will be the elaboration of what these things mean without the ability to discuss in any way operational details and never giving the ACLU what it wants. Okay. From the standpoint of this is, you know, here's a list, all these things. And that process has been set, I believe, in motion by Harold Coe, and I think that in many respects that will turn out to be his legacy to the international law community. Because in one sense, this is not truly law. This is about law, policy, domestic policy, how it fuses together with law, domestic legal authorities. But where this will gain importance is as this is asserted as state practice by the United States and a body of state practice that to many people it will look like it's merely freeing the United States to do what it wanted to do, but I believe over the longer term also has the ability in some ways to constrain the United States in this, but also to provide a set of standards and to tell other countries that they also have to be accountable in their use of covert, deniable operations, intelligence-driven uses of force that they are not now. And so I believe this is actually stepping us down the road to finding in some way um, standards for this, and I believe that that actually may turn out to be Harold Coe's most important legacy at state. So let me ask one follow-up question, and then any of our panelists, if they want to weigh in. Um, so I share with you the prediction that the, we're, we're going to have um, fewer boots on the ground in general and more sort of airstrikes or distance striking. And um, is it in some ways really problematic in, in, in several ways? One is that it reduces the kind of incentives for political and domestic oversight because, you know, drones are cheap, they're becoming cheaper and cheaper, there's no risking, direct risking of American lives, so, you know, fewer domestic checks on actually engaging in these operations. And the second, the exact uh, juxtaposition you made with sort of engaging in regime change or any time you're actually on the ground where destruction is complemented by construction. And we're choosing sort of the easy way of the destruction side of things without the constructive. Now, if the paradigm is we're only engaged in targeted killings either in direct, um, you know, active battlefields in which we already do construction or places where countries are unable and unwilling, isn't sort of the added cost of engaging in these kinds of strikes should be uh, helping these countries be able and willing, including by offering a lot of sort of basically paying for what you do? Um, I think that the greatest um, way in which the introduction of drone technology targeted killing these kinds of technologies invites more uses of force turns out to be in humanitarian intervention situations. I think that uh, if the problem in humanitarian intervention is that the parties that would engage in it and have the military capability of engaging in it 
uh, are exactly the same parties that do not want to risk their own forces for something that they regard quite accurately as an exercise of altruism on, on somebody else's behalf, then I believe that actually Libya provides the example. I mean, it's very striking to see that, uh, that this was immediately picked up on by, by some folks in the humanitarian aid community as being, well, what you need for a new model of humanitarian intervention is a local fighting force on the ground, and then we supply the drones. Um, so I, I think that it, there may be some ironies in terms of how uh, the technology plays out there, but I think that the trade-off will be how targeted you can make the kind of attacks that one's talking about. I don't think that these kinds of weapons are especially good at regime change because regime change does require boots on the ground, if not yours, somebody else's, and so that these are most effective in going after terrorist leadership in which it's genuinely targeted, high-value targets, in which there's not actually a lot of destruction. And whether it changes the governance situation on the ground, the answer is almost certainly not. And I guess I would say that the kind of somewhere between chastened and perhaps somewhat harsh and cynical conclusion is that we are not doing nation building anymore. We haven't managed to make it work and we're not gonna be trying it again anytime soon. And so to that extent, our problem is to remain out of it in some way. Um, and I realize that sounds, um, well, almost as pessimistic as the last panel. Sarah, <clears throat> well, uh, the, one, the only reason I, I didn't answer the moderator's uh, question was because I was going to start with something that she said uh, anyway, which now I can probably uh, skip over. Actually, I, I, I want to talk uh, about the ethics of... Uh, well, I will still call it the war on terror because it is still a war, and this president still says it's against terrorists, so I'm willing to call it that. But I want to begin with a couple of stories about two wartime presidents generally regarded as successful. Uh, so Abraham Lincoln, uh, during the Civil War, uh, faced a conundrum. After he finally gave in to the importunings of the radicals of his party, as well as many of his own generals, and decided to raise uh, colored regiments, uh, that the South responded by adopting as policy, there wasn't a statute, but announcing a public policy uh, that any, uh, any black uh, officers who were captured on the battlefield would be uh, summarily executed. So Lincoln, in response to this, uh, announced that for every black officer who was summarily executed by the South, that the North would execute one Confederate officer who was in custody. Now this was a plain violation of the customs and usages of war, uh, even at the time, uh, but it was widely applauded uh, in the North, uh, condemned only in, uh, in the South, and those few Lincoln historians who mention it, and there aren't many who actually talk about this, but those who do tend to uh, treat it with some sort of approbation, as this, is, this was the right thing somehow uh, to do. Uh, by the way, uh, he, he didn't actually carry out the threat, interestingly, uh, and you know, if you've studied your conflict theory, you know that uh, if the other side doesn't believe he'll carry out the threat, it, the threat doesn't do any good. So the South did sub well, there, there, some historians differ. The South apparently executed some blank officers summarily. The North did not execute summarily any of their um, uh, prisoners, and the South, Southern executions appear to have picked up a little bit after that. So the second is 1943, just before the Tehran conference, Winston Churchill has this famous meeting with his cabinet. And in the cabinet, he says that it, he's going to go to the Tehran conference with Roosevelt and, and uh, Stalin. And he's going to recommend what he thinks is the speediest way to end the war. And that is to compile a list, he thought there'd be about 50 to 100 names of it on it, of war criminals uh, who would be shot on sight. They would not be, if they were captured, they'd be summarily executed, but the preference would be for them to be killed without being captured. He thought if this were done, uh, the war would be shortened uh, appreciably. Uh, so he goes to Tehran. And uh, first he has a meeting with Roosevelt. And Roosevelt thinks it's a great idea and says, oh, I, I was thinking the same thing. Um, and then, um, then Stalin arrives late uh, to the conference. They have this famous dinner, and Elliot Roosevelt in his memoir tells the story. Uh, he was there as his father's uh, secretary. And uh, so, so they, they get to dinner, and, and uh, Churchill and 
Roosevelt present this, this uh, proposal. And Stalin says, that's great. But I think there should be 50,000 names uh, on the list. Why stop at uh, a, few, uh, a few dozen? Uh, at which point, uh, Churchill is visibly agitated. Uh, and, uh, and so FDR says, well, how about 49,000 uh, names? <laughs> and Churchill gets up and quite famously storms out of the room. And, and Stalin supposedly goes to track him down. Uh, I, I, as I recall, um, um, Roosevelt says Stalin went to track him down. And, and Churchill doesn't mention that in his memoirs. But anyway, so Churchill then says in his memoirs, you, you've got to read this stuff. Churchill says that the problem with this plan to execute 50,000 people is the public wouldn't go for it. You could never sell it to the public. You could sell summarily executing 50 or 100, but you could not sell 50,000 summary executions. He doesn't raise a moral objection. He doesn't raise an objection that has anything to do with the laws of war. He just thinks that it, just, that it would lose public support if you had the list that long. Now, I mentioned these two examples. Uh, not to say that Churchill or FDR or Lincoln were bad people or that they should have faced some kind of criminal indictment or something. I, I raise it because it, it's important, I think, always to remember when we speak of either the law of war or the ethics of war, there's also the practice of war, which, is, which dominates both quite heavily. And the practice of war uh, is governed both by domestic and international political needs, realpolitik, it's also uh, governed by its own technocratic drive. It's governed by uh, its own sense of necessity. Indeed, one of the reasons I've never liked the term uh, military necessity in international humanitarian law uh, is precisely uh, because it doesn't seem in a real sense to capture uh, uh, the, or I should say, it doesn't seem in a real sense to limit, I should say, uh, the kind of necessity-based pragmatism that lies at the heart of the successful prosecution of war. In war, crazy and terrible things happen. That's not because people who do them are crazy and terrible people. It's because war is a crazy and terrible thing. And I think whenever one thinks about war, whether it's a war fought on the ground, a war fought with drones, a war against terror groups, or any other kind of war, one has to recognize, one has to begin with that as a baseline, that's simply going to be true. Now. I start with all that because I, I do think that for me, I find myself in this peculiar position uh, where as a theorist of just war, I find uh, the terror war described memorably by President Obama uh, as the war to eliminate our enemies, as he puts it, which actually I think is a broader construction than the construction that Bush gave in his West Point uh, uh, speech. Um, I, th I find that, uh, as an ethicist of war, extremely troubling for two reasons I'm going to mention in a moment. But there's a practical, pragmatic side of myself that finds it difficult to condemn it, that understands entirely um, the, not only the political drive, but the felt necessity now of consecutive presidents of the United States who take the view that you've got to get them before they get us, which is at the heart of what's going on. Uh, in the way that it's fought, especially with the use of, of drone uh, missiles, uh, it's plainly uh, a, uh, at least in my judgment, it, it's plainly preventive and not preemptive. Preemptive war, I think, is already the outer category of self-defense. A preemptive war suggests that you know that the forces are massed and about to attack you. So uh, if you take the model of Pearl Harbor, that's what I always use in, in teaching this distinction to my students, uh, the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor is intended to destroy the U.S. fleet because the U.S. fleet is seen as a potential threat. That is a preventive war. Had the U.S. detected the Japanese fleet on its way to attack them and attacked first, that would be a preemptive war. That's the distinction between uh, the two, that one is the attack is imminent and the other is the attack might happen. We have to stop it uh, before it uh, does. The logic that uh, the British novelist John Le Carre once said would lead to us in the end strangling our children in their beds, he said. And while that may be a bit of overstatement, I, I take it that you, I, I assume that you see the point. Now, uh, Gabriella mentioned a moment ago uh, that uh, she asked, uh, well, what about the problem that when you use drones, uh, that there's no real ferment about it at home? And I think that's true. I, that's true. Um, novelist uh, John Irving said there's only three ways to get Americans to notice something, tax them, draft them, or kill them, uh, he said. And when we don't have boots on the ground, the killing that our armed forces do to protect us, and I'm granting the best will in the world to everyone involved in the process, 
is a little bit off the radar screen. It might be on the evening news, you know, that uh, one of the evening news anchors might say a U.S. drone missile attack uh, did so-and-so today, and then on to the next celebrity divorce, and that's pretty much the last that we hear of it, except as when you look at the aggregate statistics over time of what uh, happens. And that, to me, actually is the deepest problem. I, I actually think that, I, I, I actually agree with, with uh, uh, Ken Anderson, both of us said here today and what he's written, uh, that in terms of uh, proportionality and discrimination, uh, distinction under uh, humanitarian law, that the drone attacks are a net good. Uh, but I think that because of the loss in political consciousness, they're an enormous problem. It's as though uh, somehow we think the moral problem of war is uh, the killing, I mean, is, the, is the dying, but actually it's the killing. Uh, Stanley Harawas, the, the uh, uh, theologian, uh, has a book about to come out, War and the American Difference, and he ha devotes considerable time to this, and this is one of the things he talks about, that, that Americans, he, th he thinks, have become trained to imagine that the moral problem of war is that our side dies, so the, that our dying is the existential problem of war, but the moral problem of war is that our side kills. Uh, and that is where I think we need to f be a little bit better at flexing our argumentative muscles. I am not condemning all killing. As one who believes in just war theory, I recognize that wars are sometimes just and indeed sometimes have to be fought. I do believe that. But I also think that our vocabulary, our moral vocabulary for discussing them is pretty strained. And in the debates over the terror war, a lot of our public debate has been just atrocious. It's been uh, this party condemning that party or condemning that person. So much of what goes on in public is mere partisan rant. Uh, it's not particularly effective. Uh, and indeed, it demeans the project of thinking seriously about the most, most destructive thing that humans ever invented, warfare, to reduce it to the level of other partisan debates where the justification or support for a particular strategy depends on the identity of the person, the White House. That style of thought about something as important as war is terrifying, I think, as a moral uh, proposition. Now, I said that I wanted to tell you about the two moral problems I have. As a just war theorist, uh, one, of the things, one of the things that's really important in just war thinking when a war is pursued, is that it has to have a reasonable hope of success. Now, in order to have a reasonable hope of success, well, you have to have a clear understanding of what you're trying to do. And the use of targeted drone attacks to attack the leaders and infrastructure of groups that may and probably are be plotting attacks against Americans here at home uh, I suppose one could say we're going to measure the success by stopping the attacks. If the attacks don't happen, we are succeeding. If we're degrading their abilities, we are succeeding. The question is whether there's a stopping point, whether there's a stopping point. A lot of the older just war theoreticians, there were people writing before uh, Grotius got his hands on it and I think destroyed it forever. Uh, a lot of the older theorists talked about this, and what they talked about was that, you, that in order for the war to be just, it had to be clear to the other side what would make you stop. What could they do that would make you stop killing them? And conceptually, you could say, well, if all these groups just stop plotting attacks, and of course, that's right. But it's the all these groups part that's the problem. Um, that uh, the, and I'm not siding with those who say that warfare has to have a locus. I quite understand that, uh, Groups get scattered, uh, and new groups rise up, and if you're going to attack them, you'll be fighting all over the world. I quite understand and accept that. Nevertheless, there is some question as to who that they are in the end. That is, as each new group springs up, it turns out that the list of enemies uh, continues. There's not a settled entity uh, who can surrender. You can just try to make them stop, try to degrade them to the point where you make them stop. And a lot of people write about this in international humanitarian law and law of armed conflict, but as a as a matter of the ethics of war, it's hard to conceptualize because it's not clear what the surrender point, that's what it used to be called, what the surrender point is. What would make your side stop? This is why, by the way, the war re relies heavily on intelligence. The question whether you get good information uh, is a crucial one. And uh, it, Mr. Rizzo is on the panel, he can speak more about this, but it, but it strikes me uh, that it, it appears that we have actually gotten a lot of awfully good information over the years, good instances of being accurate, that's been used in 
uh, the uh, war on terror for the targeting of various leaders and so on, and that's fine as long as the information is accurate. But do bear in mind that every time, whether it's a newspaper or something that's mentioned uh, in passing from the administration, every time someone, some leader is blown up, there's a sense in which you, take, you, you have to take the word of this administration or its predecessor and the future its successor, because this is going to go on and on. You have to take their word that we had good intelligence, we knew what we were doing, trust us. And my view of democracy, but especially of war in a democracy, that trust us only works up to a certain point. When, as the war shifts more and more toward either drones or other standoff weapons where we take little risk, there are two things that are happening then. One is it drops more and more off our radar screen, and two, to the extent it's there, we're asked to place more and more trust in the public officials who have the intelligence they can't tell us about that led to the necessity of this particular attack. It may be that everybody's doing the best they can, and I tend to think most public servants most of the time really do. But the degree of trust that's involved is still quite significant when what you're being asked to approve is a campaign that is likely to go on for a very long time. Last point, and then I'll try to, I was going to try to stay within my 10 minutes to say I've actually uh, slipped uh, uh, past a little bit. I said I had two problems. So one of the problems uh, with, the, uh, with the war uh, is the lack of a, uh, of a surrender point. But there's also the original question of self-defense itself. That is to say, I, I take, uh, Ken Anderson's point I think is right, and if you look at Harold Coe's speech, which is a very important speech, I don't think he ever actually says in the speech, I think that Kenneth agreed with me this, that, well, this is naked self-defense, but it's clear that is what he's, the subtext of the speech, I think, is pretty clear. I think that, is that fair? Um, and I think it's important to preserve that. I, I think it's important to preserve for each nation the sense of the ability to judge its own um, self-defense needs. And I, I think it's difficult to impose any kind of regime of sanctions on top of that. And when I say that, people often say, well, what if, uh, rogue state X or rogue state Y goes off and does terrible thing Z because of a, scent of a claim of self-defense. Well, my view is if it's rogue state A and they're wrong, then they're wrong and they ought to lose. And they ought to lose not because uh, we successfully articulated the rules. That'd be nice if we could. I don't think we can, but because we're bigger and more powerful than they are and we can make them pay. That may seem like a terrible thing to say, but we spend 41 cents of every defense dollar spent on the face of the earth is spent by the United States. And it's not possible for any length of time for any group of nations, singly or in combination, to project large amounts of force over significant distances without American assistance and money. NATO could not have done much to hurt Libya without the United States. It's true the United States few, ver, flew very few combat sorties. There was no need to. Libya had no air defenses and they had no air force because the United States destroyed their air defenses and most of their air force on the first day of the war. In consequence of which, the NATO pilots could fly with no risk whatsoever and claim they were fly, flying the majority of combat sorties. There was only one offshore command and control ship involved in Libya war. It was an American ship. There was only one aircraft carrier for most of the time of the war because the Charles de Gaulle, the only French aircraft carrier, had to leave and the British don't have any aircraft carriers and we have nine. So there was only one aircraft carrier on station most of the time. It was an American aircraft carrier. NATO ran out of fuel. We gave them fuel. NATO ran out of money. We gave them money. NATO ran out of ammunition. We gave them ammunition. Out of the 124 cruise missiles filed on the first day of the war, 122 were American and two were British. The United States buys 200 cruise missiles every year. There's no other country in the world that has 200 cruise missiles or anything close to that in its entire arsenal. You cannot do it without the United States. We remain the indispensable nation, no matter how much we may try to pretend otherwise. There is not going to be an independent UN force, and if there were one, nobody would serve in it for any length of time because it wouldn't be home-based. A professional military relies on its non-coms who are career and who travel around the world but keep coming home. You can't construct that without a home for them to keep coming back to. I would love to live in a world where there was a serious possibility of other countries projecting force over long distances, but we don't. And in consequence, the decisions that we make politically and morally about the use of force are the ones that matter the most. If you decide, I really think somebody ought to stop the killing in Darfur, and remember Darfur is not part of South Sudan, so that Darfur contract is not solved. 
if you think someone ought to do it, you're really saying the United States ought to do it. If you think somebody else ought to do it, you're really saying it shouldn't really be done. That's the unfortunate, I think, very scary bottom line about the level of preponderance that we have. We have the largest level of preponderance we've had since World War II. By preponderance, I mean the amount by which we're out front of, of other uh, people. That makes, gives us, I think, a special moral responsibility as citizens to take seriously these debates about war, whether it is a debate about the use of cruise missiles, the debate about going to Libya, or the other debates uh, that we have. The first moral responsibility uh, rests with us. looking at the time to think about what they're doing. Uh, no, so uh, um, I got rolling in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. This is good. Uh, mm? um, it, it reminded me when you say something about um, kind of the practice of war and how we think about things and you talked about targeted killings. Remember early on there was a, this uh, poll that uh, the Haaretz newspaper did in Israel about targeted killings and it, it asked people, the first question was, do you think that targeted killings a, exacerbate terrorism, B, suppress terrorism, or C, have no effect on terrorism. And the, most of the population answered either A or C. So either it, exas it actually exacerbated terrorism or it had no effect. The second question was, do you support targeted killing? And there was an overwhelming answer of yes. Um, <laughs> so it serves many different purposes. Um, but I, I wanted to ask sort of the, the Maybe it's the Ben Weisner question, or maybe it's unfair to characterize it as the Ben Weisner question. But here is, um, so I struggle with the same questions you just posed about um, what does victory look like, right? And how can we define another battlefield? And then how do you adjust the just war tradition to questions of imminence and to question of identifying the enemy and the fact that it's not a collective, it's a individual or a set of individuals. Um, and it's interesting, you know, that in, when we talk about crime, we don't, you know, the war on crime is not intended, any, nobody thinks it's intended to eliminate crime altogether, the same with the war on drugs, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, the question of how do you know you killed the right people doesn't bother us in regular war, right? You just assume that the people you kill are combatants and it's fine and you don't worry yourself about it. So how much of that is just this, hydra that we've created by calling it war, and that if you actually refrain from trying to twist the just war tradition, that you're, we're trying to fit something that it wasn't meant to fit, and that this is where the problem really starts, and that this is really where the problem ends, um, and that we actually created all this, we caused all these questions to come up the moment we declared a war, the moment we decided to treat it as war, rather than extraterritorial policing, for instance, or um, something of that kind. I'll, I'll be very, very brief, because that's exactly what I assume Sarah Cleveland is going to uh, uh, tell us. Uh, but, but just on, on one uh, very small point, I, I, I guess the, the one premise I disagree with, uh, the, the early versions of just war theory, and here I'm thinking about, say, not so much Augustine as Aquinas, um, it, it seemed pretty clear, uh, at least on, on my reading, uh, that the what, I, what, what used to be called the war on terror, whatever wants to call it now, I think would fit into his framework. He's, he's, he wasn't so much thinking Aquinas wasn't about, when he thought about what makes it war, who the other guy is. He was thinking about who you are. And his view was when the sovereign asks you to go off and fight, um, that's, when you're, uh, that's when you're at war. At least that's the problem that he was uh, thinking about. There's actually there's very little um, in Aquinas about what actually constitutes just cause. Um, there's a lot about uh, how, why you should obey the command of the sovereign and, um, uh, and so on. Sarah? I think I'll save mine. Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah. Okay. So uh, first I'd like to thank Rita Hauser for supporting this program and uh, Dean Minow for being the remarkable dean she is, uh, and Gabby and Ben Wittes for putting this program together and including me. I'm delighted to be here. I, uh, uh, perhaps even more than Trevor, feel the, the need to say that although I left the government a month ago, absolutely nothing that I'm going to say in, in any way reflects the views of the US government. Um, and I wanted to just flag, I come from the land of David Letterman, it should be a list of 10, but I don't have time for 10, so I'm going to flag eight trends that I see um, 
in the international response to counterterrorism over the next 10 years. And I think these trends have to be understood um, from the perspective that the 9-11 attacks were devastating. They were a grotesque human rights violation. They were a crime against humanity. They were a clear act of aggression, as John Brennan said last night. And they demonstrated a, the existence of a kind of threat that we had not appreciated to that point that has altered our thinking about these issues. But I think it's also true that aspects of the initial response of the United States to those attacks had harmful effects also on our ability to respond to counterterrorism going forward, and that both of those have sort of set the parameters for and the constraints on our ability to um, move and our options going forward. So the eight trends. Um, first, we don't live in a risk-free world. We can't prosecute, interrogate, detain, or target our way to perfect safety. Juan emphasized this point the other day. Ultimately, the answer to terrorism is going to be co to cooperate with other governments to build rule of law institutions in locations where terrorists might seek harbor to prevent that from occurring. Second, cooperation is essential, and this may sound like I'm on the opposite side of Steve Carter, but I don't think I really am. I don't just mean cooperation in military activities, although I do think it's essential there. I think it is essential in the entire package of responses to counterterrorism um, or to terrorism globally. We can't do it alone. That is one of the lessons of the last 10 years, and it has very important implications for uh, our options. One of those implications is my third point. Torture is off the table. There are many reasons that it is off the table, but one of them is that our allies will not cooperate with us if we are perceived as a country that engages in torture. They will not share intelligence with us. They will not transfer people to our custody for either interrogation, detention, or prosecution. They will not take action to cooperate with us in law enforcement that is in our interests on their soil. They have made that very clear. Uh, whatever the, um, you know, the shifts in the law and the uncertainty that existed as of 9-11 and its immediate aftermath, the last 10 years has told us that the international community thinks that the law couldn't shift that far. Um, fourth, related, accountability issues will remain on the table for us internationally. Uh, we have seen attempts in the last few years to prosecute uh, U.S. personnel in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in Poland. All of these, well, at least many of these, for various reasons, have been rejected on the grounds that the United States is able and willing to respond appropriately to these events. There is, a, there is a good faith assumption that that is true. That will not, necessary, not, will not necessarily carry us forever. Uh, but I, and, I, and this isn't a statement that you know, we should be going out and prosecuting everyone, including John. The, the point is, the point is <laughs> that we need to be able to demonstrate to the international community that we have looked searchingly at this issue, whether it's by Truth Commission, some equivalent of 9-11. Um, in the Spanish prosecution, I think, is an interesting example in which the Justice Department presented to the Spanish court a sort of a menu of all the various investigations and accountability efforts that the United States has taken relating broadly to these issues. And the Spanish court said, okay, well, I'm going to dismiss this case um, based on that good faith effort. Um, fifth, I do not believe that the solution to this problem will be long-term law or detention for out-of-theater captures or Guantanamo going forward. I believe that for a variety of reasons. One is that it is less necessary than it seemed to be as of um, you know, the spring of 2002. Um, at that time, evidence wasn't being collected at capture. There were individuals for whom 
torture um, and enhanced interrogation techniques had been used that prevented their prosecution, and fundamentally, our criminal laws did not reach a lot of the conduct that occurred. These considerations will not apply going forward. That doesn't mean there's never going to be a circumstance in which um, law of war detention might be appropriate, but the impetuses that existed at the time um, are not there today to as great an extent. Second, the politics have made it, I would say, impossible to, to do the thing Juliet was talking about yesterday, the ratchet down, that it, the politics of detention have made it extraordinarily difficult to let people go because of fear of the risk that is involved. And this is a significant deterrent um, to the, the idea that you can create a responsible preventive detention regime. Uh, third, it is inter internationally controversial to detain in law of war context people who are captured out of theater for some of the reasons John Bren Brennan mentioned last night. And fourth, there will be a general challenge to our armed conflict model once we eventually pull out of Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I'm not saying an armed conflict model will not be available, but it will be um, it will be a challenge because part of traditional definitions of un armed conflict involve an intensity of hostile activity in a particular geographic area. Six, a mixed set of responsive tools is going to be more important going forward. Mixed tools, not predominantly a law enforcement model, partly for the reason I just said, but partly because we now understand that these are actors that sometimes engage in criminal activity, sometimes engage in warlike activity, sometimes um, engage in activity that uh, looks like both. And a single paradigm for responding uh, is not sufficiently flexible to, to respond adequately. I think it's, it's very interesting that, for example, in Colombia today, uh, where there is an ongoing internal armed conflict, Colombian authorities have adopted an overtly mixed regime for responding so that uh, they have a two-color card system. One card represents an IHL re law of war response and one represents a law enforcement response. Different legal regimes apply in those two contexts, including whether or not lethal force may be uh, lawfully used. And each day at the beginning of an operation, they are given the card to tell them which legal model they are operating under. I'm not advocating that, I just find it very interesting that they do not find themselves confined to any particular model. Um, seventh, human rights law, I believe, will be more integrated into conflict and quasi-conflict settings for three reasons. One is the mixed nature of the threats as a factual matter. Um, you know, as we've said, these are non-state groups in, engaging often far from any hot battlefield in criminal as well as hostile activity. It challenges the rules regarding how to respond. Second, institutionally, the in, international and regional institutions that exist for overseeing are human rights institutions, and I, I think structurally this is a very interesting phenomenon, but there is no oversight body that oversees state compliance with IHL obligations. The ICRC opines and engages in um, private communication with states, but there's nothing like the regional human rights courts in the Inter-American and the European system. There's nothing like the UN treaty bodies, the UN special rapporteurs, the Human Rights Council, all of those are human rights bodies and all of those to the extent that questions come up regarding responses to terrorism, they will be viewed through a human rights lens, which has, I think, to some extent, an ex a distortive um, influence of, of projecting human rights law into these contexts. And then third, from a cooperation point of view, regardless of what we may think the extraterritorial application of our own human rights treaty obligations is, the Europeans with which we have to closely cooperate are now clearly subject to a legal regime in which 
at least some of their human rights obligations apply to at least some extraterritorial conduct in armed conflict settings. And notably, um, these in particular are the Alskani and Al Jeddah decisions from this summer. This means that they have to be sensitive to those issues. These issues are justiciable in their national courts and in the European Court of Human Rights. They cannot join Security Council resolutions that violate their fundamental human rights law obligations. And combined with international law principles regarding state responsibility over aiding and assisting, it means they have to, they have to think before they cooperate with us whether what we do as a result of that cooperation is going to so fundamentally conflict with their legal obligations that they can't do it. I'm not saying the, you know, the understandings or the interpretations have to be identical, but there is a parameter beyond which we cannot step and expect their cooperation. And then finally, with respect to targeting, I agree with Ken um, and Steve Carter that I think this is the primary legal and ethical challenge um, of the future in this area. I, you know, think about proliferation issues. Think about the problems that would or could arise if the drone capacity is possessed by China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. What would be the legal standards you would want to apply to the use of this power in those hands? Um, as John Brennan said last night, there is disagreement between the United States and some of our allies regarding the, the geographic scope, the area in which we can act consistent with uh, the rules of armed conflict as opposed to rules of self-defense. Um, this produces, among other things, ongoing challenges, and I shouldn't say this because I think separately from that fact, there are ongoing challenges in this area that will remain, as Ben and others will remind us, regarding what process um, a state must engage in to make these decisions, how transparent or non-transparent those decisions can be, and how we should define the substantive concepts that operate in this realm, including concepts of imminence and necessity that go to how much threat is sufficient to use uh, lethal force, and when, as a matter either of law or policy, lethal force nevertheless should not be used because other um, options such as capture are available. I think these are um, important challenges, and I think that John Brennan's speech yesterday was a very significant nod in the direction of further development of um, the thinking on these issues. So that should be enough to provoke a few people, and I will stop there. Thank you. Sarah, one quick follow-up is about the international cooperation part of it. So um, how much really should the United States be worried about this? So, you know, I'm convinced that, yes, there are important developments in the European Court of Human Rights. We talked a little bit about this last night. Um, the European Court of Human Rights has a clear agenda of raising the cost of war uh, at every possible junction. Um, and it seems to me that, yes, it could impose far more constraints on coalition operations. At the same time, the torture example seems to me like a very easy one. It wasn't, I mean, you can argue about how widely it was or wasn't used by the United States, but the military was against it, the FBI said they don't really need it, the American public was up in arms. This is not, I don't think that this was foregone mainly because we were worried that the British will not transfer any more detainees to us. It was mostly a political argument. So, you know, if the European um, or some of the European countries came up and said tomorrow, we don't think you can do targeted killings in Somalia or Yemen. We don't think you can uh, do a lot of things you are currently doing. How much of that is really a constraint on us and how much is it sort of a token that we used, I think a little bit also by Brennan yesterday to sort of justify certain domestic positions and use it sort of as a tool in the political debate by referring, oh, we also, this is also our allies' expectations and we want them to be on board. I think it's very hard to underestimate the, 
the harm to U.S. diplomatic relations broadly um, that can arise from a fundamental sense that the United States is not complying with international law as understood by our partners. And um, I say that, you know, knowing that our partners understand that we disagree with them on some interpretations of international law, and they live with those disagreements, but um, if, as in, and, and the torture example may be easy, but I think, I think if you just think about this from our perspective, if the United States is cooperating with another country, we will be worried about whether that cooperation will result in some kind of gross human rights violation, right? And so likewise, I think anyone that cooperates with us that takes their international law obligations seriously will have the same concerns. And it just, it's a constantly operative question that, that wouldn't play out like, you know, we think you shouldn't do this. It would just make it hard to do a lot of things in various ways. <clears throat> Actually, if I could jump in, um, <clears throat> my experience was um, during the um, latter stages of the, um, of the agency's interrogation program, uh, in fact, there were several foreign governments because of the, um, but, but at that point, most of the details and what they were had leaked out. So there were actually a number of uh, uh, cooperating intelligence services, you know, Western intelligence services, who, uh, Restricted and in a couple of cases uh, uh, cut off um, intelligence sharing uh, with the United Probably. States yeah. with uh, the agency. So I mean, it did. It did. I mean, you know, I guess it would be better <laughs> better for me personally if I said it had no effect, but it did. It did have an effect. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. So, so I think what Sarah says has some has some uh, resonance. Um, so it's not. I hesitate to use the words torture and easy in the same sentence, but it's not, an e it's not as easy or as straightforward as one might think. On the other hand, I will tell you that, that uh, in the, uh, the cynical uh, world of intelligence uh, uh, relationships, there were a couple of countries that publicly um, went to their uh, uh, parliaments and said that um, they were going to seek assurances uh, from the United States government that there, that no information uh, that they that they would tell the foreign services would tell the United States CIA, actually, that they would no longer uh, provide any any um, they would no longer accept any intelligence uh, that was derived by coercive techniques. Which, what, which is what your, their euphemism was for the uh, inter interrogation program. And that, and that they, would, they would go to CIA and say that, which they did. And uh, they said, we want assurances that you won't, that anything you pass us is not derived. And I was, I was part of some of these discussions and I said, well, we can't do that. I mean, what you describe as course of techniques, we can't, it'll be a diminution of what we give you. Uh, and that upset them greatly. Um, so uh, in, in, in a couple of cases, the, the, the governments you know, publicly said that they insist on this from CIA, what but happened? privately Sorry. said, keep it coming. So it's a, it's a, it was a complicated area, but the point of this was, I take Sarah's point, I think it does have some validity. There's no uh, gainsaying the fact that, that this whole torture debate controversy did have an impact on our foreign intelligence relationships. So it's also your turn now. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I promise I'm gonna be under 10 minutes. Um, uh, first of all, I, w I will also uh, thank Gabby and Ben for uh, inviting me. Uh, this has been very instructive for me. I, I've sat through all, all of it. And uh, uh, I actually did a lot of this up here on uh, did a lot of speaking engagements and panels, and actually while I was still at CIA in the last several uh, years there. Uh, and I always enjoy doing them. Um, 
and I've continued to do them since I uh, since I uh, left. Um, so, uh, and, the, and one of the reasons I enjoy doing them is is uh, the feedback and the the uh, the expressions of uh, people have different differing views. And sure, I've certainly heard some differing views uh, in the last two days from uh, what I've been used to. So I appreciate that opportunity and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to, uh, on the theme of looking forward, I'm going to combine my remarks to to looking uh, to looking uh, forward. Um, you know, I, I'm not I'm mindful of the fact that some of you said we have to look back, and I'm happy to look back too. But given my given my uh, short time here, let me just let me just uh, give you just a couple of important trends I think to look for look towards uh, in the uh, in the coming years. And this will be the first time I'll be able to set, to do such an analysis with a degree of total detachment, since I will have nothing to do with these uh, these trends. So let me uh, just uh, briefly uh, go through. First of all, um, uh, as other sp speakers have mentioned, um, the Obama administration, I think, uh, has largely continued uh, the the policies. There's no getting around that. The policies. Uh, of the counterterror policies of the Bush administration. Now, um, you know, obviously there is a notable exception there of the of the uh, uh, CIA interrogation program, which is which is gone and is never coming back. Um, um, but by and large, and uh, I made this I made this point a short time ago in an interview I did for a frontline uh, program, one of those 9/11 retrospectives. So there is a so so. Uh, I don't. I, I served for nine months in the Obama administration, and I will tell you, it's 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 largely in the counterterrorism arena and in other CIA covert operations arenas. There's been no there's been no change, and as as you all know and have noticed, in some areas, actually, the Obama administration has has uh, taken uh, taken more uh, aggressive policies. So I certainly don't see that uh, diminishing uh, uh, over time. If the president is elected to a second term. Uh, I, I certainly with no with no uh, political uh, imperative to to uh, trim its sails uh, in this direction. I would imagine uh, at least for the next what five years uh, it'll be it'll be uh, more of the same for whatever you may you may think of that. Um, the one that, there was one area that was actually touched on last night that that uh, I don't think has gotten enough attention. Kind of wonky, and it's not waterboarding or anything like that. But I think it's it's going to be terribly important, especially given the increased role that cyber warfare is going to play. And that is John uh, John Brennan mentioned this in passing. What we call the Title Ten versus Title Fifty uh, dichotomy: um, military operations, clandestine military operations, as they call them, versus covert action operations uh, by CIA. Now the authorities there, I will tell you, the Title 50 authorities, uh, someone that asked a question made a comment last night about CIA getting more and more into the cyber uh, warfare activities, or even you could extend them to uh, any future involvement in your own uh, activities. Same general idea. For CIA to do these kinds of things, it has to jump through a number of legal hoops set by Congress under Title 50, presidential authorizations, reports. Uh, of, of, of signing of presidential findings, reporting them to Congress, keeping the intelligence committees fully and currently informed. Very, very, very strong and very rigorous, I must say, oversight regime for CIA covert actions. I have, I have, I have never gotten the sense that when the military conducts its, its similar operations, though not acknowledged, uh, under its Title X authorities, which I'm crudely generalizing here, but it's under the rubric of protecting the war space, protecting the battlefield. I have never sensed that there's that same amount of high level review and scrutiny either inside the executive branch or with respect to reporting these activities, planned or actual, uh, to, uh, to the Congress. And this would be in the form of the, for DOD, the Armed Services Committee. So I think that tension between Title 10 and Title 50, and you know, contrary, I think there's some, there's some perception out there that, if, that only CIA has to get presidential findings, only CIA does covert action. If a, another agency does something, 
similar, it's, it's something else. Well, it's, it's not what the law says. Any agency that conducts a covert action operation, which is basically defined in law, is, a, is an operation to affect events overseas without the U.S. government hand being apparent or acknowledged, uh, that would require a finding. That's covert action, no matter who does it. Now, the reality was in 35 years of in this business, uh, most of which was involved in, in either creating or monitoring covert action programs, there's never been another agency in the government that's got a presidential finding other than the CIA. But that does, that does not mean that, that DOD or any other agency is, is legislatively off the hook. So I just wonder how this is going to play out over the years. Now, this, this will usually come to a head, uh, this comes to, it will come to a head, I suspect, in the usual way, which is something goes terribly wrong sometimes, sometime, and there is a post postmortem. So uh, uh, I would advise, I would, I would just suggest that, uh, uh, certainly for us lawyers, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tension, it's an issue that I think, that I think is, worth, uh, is worth paying attention to. Um, to, to circle back to Gabby's point about the increased use of uh, increased paramilitary role for CIA uh, in the future, uh, I don't I don't dispute that. That seems to be certainly seems to be an inclination of the uh, of the Obama administration. Um, I find I institutionally for the agency that I love, I I think uh, history will tell us that that's a that's a potentially risky path. Uh, uh, paramilitary operations by the agency uh, of any sort, either boots on the ground or by remote, by remote control, when we have been involved in them, they have tended to be long, long running and, and inevitably, in one way or the other, it snarl the agency into uh, long run, a long running conflicts or controversy. So uh, uh, if in fact that's, if that's now the assigned Increased role for CIA. I frankly would view that with some uh, with some uh, trepidation. Finally, finally, I want to speak briefly because others have mentioned it uh, about what I see as a future role of uh, as this military commission to detain detainee trials uh, play out. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned to Ben before I came on. I'm going to agree with something with something uh, several of the points he made, which I hope is not. Overly alarming to you, Ben, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, believe it or not, uh, first of all, I sat through eight years of the Bush administration, close to a year of the Obama administration, innumerable lawyers committee meetings on detainee issues and military tribunals, and it was it was endless uh, and uh, and enormously uh, enormously frustrating. Um, I would agree, I agree, I think Ben and others made this point, it is a travesty, a disgrace really, that no, no detainee in custody with 9-11 blood in his hands, uh, as yet none of them have been tried, much less convicted. I think that's a, I think for one thing, for the most important thing, that is, that is a tremendous, huge disservice to the, uh, families of the 9-11 victims, and uh, I just think it's, uh, it's uh, inexcusable. Um, which, which brings me to, to my second point, with which I agree with my friend. I'll get to this quickly. I can do this in less than two minutes, because we'll run out of the things we agree on, I think. But um, <laughs> um, uh, I've always been a fan of Title III courts. CIA, CIA has been involved in my time many uh, prosecutions, terrorist prosecutions, other prosecu espionage prosecutions. Uh, I can't remember in any of those prosecutions, even the most contentious, um, that any significant CIA uh, information was, was improperly uh, disclosed or leaked. We have the Classified Information Procedures Act has been in effect for years. We have seasoned, experienced ass assistant U.S. attorneys uh, that know our equities, know our work. We have, we have judges. Uh, the, the enormously fair, uh, uh, no, certainly not pushovers, but enormously fair. So the system, I think the Title III system has largely worked for CIA. As it happens, we were never, at least while I was there, we were never asked our opinion in any deliberations which way we preferred. 
Title III or the military tribunals. Uh, if, if asked, I would have voted for Title for uh, Art, uh, Article III, and I still uh, I still uh, believe that. Yeah, man. I'll just wrap that up on that score on that point. Good. Uh, so maybe two follow-ups. Uh, one is the point Stephen made earlier, and earlier Ben and Deborah and others have raised. And let me try and, re and phrase the question in a way that would allow you to respond. If <laughs> if the CIA were to have a drone program, mm -hmm. what might be the reason not to say anything or about what the considerations or what the process are when the program is operating? Okay, well, I have to be chastened here because I, uh, <clears throat> I, yes, I, uh, in speaking to the, to the press on this uh, subject, I, I exceeded my brief a few months ago, so I have to be somewhat uh, careful. Uh, so, I mean, if we were to have such a program, uh, what would be the reason why it would have to be kept covert? Is that, is that the question? Well, all aspects of it. So one can imagine saying something about the process of, you know, how the intelligence is brought, who makes the decision, what the authority, uh, the chain of command, what the, you know, proportionality analysis for collateral yeah. damage, certain things that are more sort of procedural but talk about the process, the considerations, the monitoring, the checks. I don't think that a judge needs to be involved. Uh, and, you know, there is a parallel Israeli program, but I, I feel like we said much more about the Israeli program than America ever did about its own program. Yeah, Gabby, I think, actually, my view is there's nothing, there's no reason why the process, if there were such a process, couldn't be, um, couldn't be spelled out. Um, because, I mean, among other things, I think it would give some, some uh, reassurance um, uh, to the public uh, that, 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 the, uh, that such programs are, are conducted um, with uh, extreme care uh, in terms of assuring that the intended targets, that there is sufficient intelligence uh, to identify the target, that it's a valid target, uh, extraordinary steps that are, that are taken to minimize collateral damage in, in civilians. The approval chain for each of these, uh, each of these uh, uh, operations. Um, I think, frankly, it is, it, the process is something uh, that I think uh, certainly most fair-minded people, I think, were, or would uh, consider um, uh, reasonable, if not you know, uh, leaving aside the underlying morality or legality of the action itself. So I would, I would certainly vote for that. And, they say I've gotten myself into a bit of trouble in the last uh, last year or two by because of a desire to to make that point. I uh, I may have gone beyond. Uh, so we kept this all hypothetical. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you said almost in passing that you agreed that um, it's likely that the CIA will be more involved in kind of quasi military or paramilitary activities abroad, and you say it's potentially problematic. Can you say a couple words more on what aspects of why it is problematic in your view? Um, well, for two reasons. At CIA, I mean, I, you know, my, my, my knowledge in, uh, of CIA paramilitary programs goes back to the late 70s, from Afghanistan 1, as we used to call it. Um, uh, they tend to First of all, they, they're 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 not quick strikes. You get once you get in, you get you get in, you get sucked in. Uh, it it eats up lots of money, lots of human resources inside the agency, uh, to the detriment of other programs and other parts of what I always considered CIA's core mission, which was espionage, uh, and also diverts the analytical uh, cadre necessarily. I mean, uh, so it's it's. History has shown that to be inside the agency tends to be a morass more often than not. And as I say, a, uh, something that, that the, the other vital missions of the agencies uh, are invariably um, uh, affected by. Uh, and in this time that the intelligence community, along with, with the DOD, is facing a, a substantial hit in its budget and resources, uh, I think I think that's troublesome. 
Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite any of the panelists to make additional remarks or thoughts. And I have a question for John. You should pose it. Um, uh, John, I, I do have a, a short question, and maybe this is something you can't, uh, you can't talk about, but, um, but a couple of us mentioned, and, and this comes up all the time, that, it, that to the extent that we're going to rely on, on uh, targeted attacks on leaders and infrastructure of terror groups, we have to have good information. That is, we have to know that we're actually hitting what we think we're hitting, what we're trying to hit. We act, we'll never be entirely, we have to have some degree of confidence. And I don't know, without uh, betraying anything, what you can say about your general sense of how are we doing there? That is, I'm not I'm asking do we hit what we're aiming for, but just in terms of do we generally, we had getting good information, I guess is really what, I, information that's good enough to, whether hypothetically or not, I, that, that seems to me to be a crucial question because the previous administration began the drone campaigns, this administration really ramped them up, and this looks like the way of the future, as everybody said. That relies heavily on what we know. I wonder if there's anything you can tell us about that. Well, I mean, uh, you know, my experience in this area ended uh, December of '09 when I, when I retired, left the agency, so I can't speak to now. And then, you know, from what I, what I read, and it's clear, the Obama administration has, has ramped up considerably um, uh, the number of, uh, of these kinds of attacks. All I can tell you is, is um, during my time, without, again, acknowledging the CIA was always quite punctilious about the intelligence uh, that was required, the timeliness of it, the freshness of it, to ensure that, that before an individual was, was, uh, was selected, that's the correct word, for, uh, for a targeted action, that the intelligence, uh, one, was fresh, that he remained a imminent threat, and that two, that the, that the location of the person, the person was who it would be the subject of, target of these, uh, uh, what would be a target, would, would, uh, in, in the, the agency site, so to speak, was the person who we thought it was. It was, it was, uh, it was really quite, it was quite um, extensive. Now, I don't know, you know, they apparently they're doing a lot more of these now. I'd like to think that the standards are still the same as what they were, but, you know, I mean, they're a lot more active, so. Sir? So I, I feel the obligation to respond to the point about um, the Obama administration having largely continued Bush administration policies, I think in part it depends on what Bush administration policies and when you are talking about, but um, some of those policies included policies of detention, long-term detention with no process of individuals in law-free zones taking the position that neither the U.S. Constitution, human rights law, or common Article Three or other principles of humanitarian law applied. Um, secret detention facilities denying ICRC access. Um, the Obama administration came in after the federal courts had changed some of those policies as a matter of law, but President Obama supported habeas for the Gitmo detainees before the Supreme Court ordered that habeas applied there um, and has taken a number of steps to ensure that there is improved process at Bagram as well, ICRC access, he closed the CIA secret detention facilities. He ordered a substantial um, examination of U.S. transfer practices, um, including a number of recommendations that the president adopted and the agencies are implementing to ensure that transfers in the future are consistent with our international law obligations. And so I think that although there are elements um, and significant elements, there are, you know, the law of war framework exists, law of war detention um, exists in limited ways, um, and targeting exists. But otherwise, I think um, a lot of the, the legal foundations for those policies have changed significantly. No, I don't, I mean, I don't dispute that. I was I was just going to mention in passing that I mean take the state secrets policy uh, privilege uh, that John uh, alluded to last night in his list. Let's go straight. 
It is true because I was part of the review process. The president ordered uh, his then White House counsel, Greg Craig, to do a review of all the existing assertions of state secret privilege, uh, then extant. And the agency was, was involved in a number of those cases. So I sat in the task force. It was very, it was, it was professionally, objectively reviewed. Everything was reviewed. Um, the, the, uh, the Justice Department ultimately concluded that all of the state secret assertions that had been taken uh, uh, were taken validly. Uh, the administration confirmed all of those. Now, it is it's true, as John mentioned, that they articulated a policy about the future assertion of state secret privileges and the, and the and notably the fact the Attorney General had to personally prove them. And that's true. But at least as far as CIA is concerned, we'd already been doing that for all of our state secret privilege assertions in previous years. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is the bottom line is that the agency, uh, and I don't mean this critically, but I mean basically the agency did not, was not required to it, it change any of its practices or policies or procedures with when it came to uh, asserting the state secrets privilege. So that's what I was trying to get at. So we have to close the panel. Uh, join me by thanking our panelists. Thank you, thank you. And we'll take a short break and resume at 3.50.